The Democratic Party today is not the Democratic Party of the 1960s and the 1970s. There is a convergence or a realignment. And the realignment is that both parties are getting worse every four years. And if we are so taken by the least worst option and we become a least worst voter, we are telling the least worst party, the Democrats, that they can take us for granted. And if they can take us for granted, they're going to take us. And that's the mistake that progressives are making. They're so freaked out by the Republicans that they make no functional demands on the Democrats in an election year. Let's hold the Democratic Party up to an opposition role. What could they have stopped that they didn't stop? They could have stopped the war. They could have stopped the tax cuts for the rich. They could have stopped any number of things, whether by filibuster, by raising the standard high and mobilizing public opinion when the polls were on their side on so many of these things, like tax cuts for the rich. That's never happened in the middle of hostilities in the American history. They always raise taxes, excess profits tax on to pay for the war. The Democrats controlled the Senate when the first big tax cut came through in 2002. Uh, and uh, uh, where were they? They just didn't have the guts to stop it. Were the Democrats willing to go to the mat against Alito and Roberts? Well, they weren't willing. They didn't. They had far more power uh, to stop them uh, than they used. I was up there lobbying against Bork, I, and that was a success. It was a great coalition. I was up there lobbying against Scalia, and I would ask Al Gore, and I would ask uh, Ted Kennedy and Paul Sarbanes all these great senators, you're going to vote for Scalia? Well, he's going to win anyway. Well, I said, but you know, I can't find a senator, not one senator to vote against Scalia. And he wasn't hiding his candle under a barrel during the testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Scalia was confirmed 98 to nothing. So then in, in comes Thomas. And George Mitchell, the Democratic majority leader, sitting in his office. And we're going in one senator's office after another. And it was really close. And of course, Bush called Thomas the most qualified nominee that he could find. And he was the heir to the seat of Thurgood Marshall. And so we would go in one senator after another, say, is Mitchell really? You know, twisting arms here? Is he using his power? No, he's just letting us decide. He's not leading the way against Thomas. And uh, the vote was 52 48. 11 Democratic senators crossed the aisle and voted for Thomas. So, why don't we evaluate the Democrats in their opposition role? In their opposition role. What have they stopped? Now, the Democrats see nothing wrong with the anti-civil libertarian move of knocking the third party or independent candidate off the ballot in the most vicious ways. You know, when you run for office, you're running free speech, petition, and assembly. And that doesn't seem to bother a lot of liberal Democrats. They liked Buchanan running, didn't they? But they didn't want our voters to have a chance to vote for the candidates of their choice, not by arguing us or having a better platform, no, but by maneuvering these state laws that the Republicans and Democrats have enacted to get us off the ballot in more than a few states. I don't consider that a civil liberties position. That's one of the last remaining areas of political bigotry that don't raise the hackles of the ACLU. When you deny the right of candidates to be on the ballot by harassment and phony litigation and all these uh, partisan state uh, ballot access laws, you are denying millions of voters their choice. The central issue is who's planning the future 
of our country, systemically, year after year, day after day. Major corporations are planning our political future, they're planning our electoral future, they plan our educational future, corporatizing universities, Channel One in the lower grades. They're planning our, our environmental future, if they can get away with it, fossil fuel, coal, more and more support on that, including among more than a few Democrats. They're planning our uh, military budget and foreign policy future. They're planning our genetic future, for heaven's sake. They, they've patented thousands of uh, human gene sequences. They're planning everything. And <coughs> Washington is corporate-occupied territory. Both parties are getting worse every four years, and if we are so taken by the least worst option and we become a least worst voter, every four years both parties will get worse. The least worst voting mentality has no end game. There is no end game because there is no breaking point because forever and ever in the future, one party will not be as bad as the other party. But both of them become worse every four years unless you change that level of urgency. At what point is your breaking point? That's the key. And to have a breaking point transform itself into an alternative option so people who are sick of the two parties and sick of waiting and waiting can go and voice themselves in, on, a, on another part of the ballot. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with a competitive democracy? What's wrong with freedom of speech inside the electoral arena? Like the nation, they loved my freedom of speech outside the electoral arena. When I'd write an article or I'd make a speech, but when I went inside the electoral arena and exercised my right of free speech, petition, and assembly, they had a full-page editorial, don't run. Well, let me tell you something. I will never and never say to anybody, don't run, any more than I would say to anybody, don't speak.